and welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's episode, Emily Chambly-Wright joins us to talk about socialism, with polling showing that Generation Z has a much more positive view of socialism than previous generations, and of course, with the Democratic candidates embracing socialism left and right, discussing whether free is ever free is really important. So there's much to discuss. Some of the highlights is that she's going to define socialism and whether or not young people have a true understanding of the system, um, explain the role of free markets in a free society, and explain why it's so important to have these conversations in the first place. Before we bring Emily on, let me tell you a little bit about her. Emily Chambly-Wright is president and CEO of the Institute for Humane Studies, which works with scholars who advance a deeper understanding of ideas in the classical liberal intellectual tradition. Prior to joining IHS in 2016, she served as the provost and dean of the college at Washington College and was previously the Albert H. Neese Professor of Economics and Associate Dean at Beloit College. Obviously, she has a lot of knowledge and wisdom she can teach us today. So, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Beverly, it's great to be here. And I recently read an op-ed that you had in the Wall Street Journal. It was titled, Please Take Socialism Seriously. On one hand, I think many Americans are rightly concerned that socialism, socialism seems to be popular again. But you said in this article that it's at least good to have the debate about socialism versus capitalism. Why do you think it's good for us to have this discussion and to, to look at this as an opportunity to talk about the differences? When we take serious ideas like socialism, which is a serious idea, seriously, then we learn. And that's really the whole point, Beverly, is that when we take a big, meaty subject area like this, something that is paradigm shaping like the idea of socialism, it's an opportunity to really open up doors for learning. And I know this term socialism, there has been a lot of debates about whether or not young people really understand what that term means. Do you think that many times young people hear socialism and have a good impression of it because they think it's more of a social safety or social welfare system and not government ownership of everything? That's a really good distinction because when Marx was talking about socialism, he was talking about a a full design of the entire economy that he saw his he saw the way towards human flourishing as having a kind of top down control of the entire economic system and his his argument was that that was going to be the pathway where people would now lead lives that were fulfilling and flourishing and when we uh, talk to uh, people who in a contemporary um, sense favor socialism, oftentimes they're talking about something very different. And sometimes it's as vague as, I just want something better than what we have now. And it seems like these folks that talk about democratic socialism, for example, are offering us something that we don't have right now, and that sounds appealing. And so that oftentimes is just the simple thing that people are favoring. Well, I'm glad you brought up the term democratic socialism. I want to back up a little bit and play a clip. And this is all the way from back in 2015 when Bernie Sanders was debating Hillary Clinton on CNN. And he explained what democratic socialism is to him. And what democratic socialism is about is saying that it is immoral and wrong that the top one tenth of one percent in this country own almost 90 percent, almost own almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. That it is wrong today in a rigged economy that 57 percent of all new income is going to the top one percent. That when you look around the world, you see every other major country providing health care to all people as a right, except the United States. You see every other major country saying to moms that when you have a baby, we're not going to separate you from your newborn baby because we are going to have. But we are going to have medical and family paid leave like every other country on earth. Well, Emily, so Bernie Sanders talks about democratic socialism. What is your definition of that? What exactly are the democratic candidates talking about when they use this term? I think in some ways they're trying to soften the impression of socialism of the past and trying to put a new spin on it. Is there anything new about democratic socialism? 
one of the things that students will say when they're talking about democratic socialism and what they find appealing is very similar to uh, what uh, Sanders was, was describing is something that's much more akin to what we might uh, see with Denmark or Sweden. It certainly isn't the Soviet-type system that they're describing or that they're saying that they want to uh, move towards. It's certainly nothing like Venezuela when people are talking in, in um, you know, uh, uh, flowery terms about democratic socialism. They're not thinking about socialism as it was practiced in uh, the context of the Soviet Union, for example. And that's an important thing as an educator for us is if there are people who are talking to students about this because we need to always start where students are. And so if students are understanding the alternatives between socialism and capitalism in these terms, then we need to understand that. We need to understand where exactly it is that they uh, think that uh, the opportunities lie. And so someplace like uh, uh, Denmark or Sweden is uh, a perfectly fine place for us to begin, but then we need to be clear uh, that that's not socialism. Uh, in fact, there's a great deal of market coordination happening in societies like this, and in fact, um, a, quite a good amount of economic freedom. Then layered on top of that, we have a great deal of social welfare redistribution, but it's markets that are generating the wealth that's getting redistributed in the first place. So let's talk about markets a little bit. It seems that the free market and capitalism seem like dirty terms to many people out there. I I know you have talked a lot about crony capitalism, so not true capitalism. Um, Tell us about the free market. Do we even have a free market in the states? And how do you think is the best way to talk about it and why you think it's a better system of economics and socialism? The best way to think about markets is that they are an engine, or maybe the better metaphor would be an ecosystem for growing solutions. Market prices, for example, are really kind of a system where we communicate with people that we don't know um, personally, across the globe even, we can communicate with one another essential information through a system of market prices. And the reason why that's important is because that those market prices and those market signals allow us, guide us to engage in economic action in a rational way. And so when we think about entrepreneurial discovery as an example of uh, what happens in the market, entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial ideas could be generated, you know, thousands a day, but it's the market price system that allows us to sort the good ideas from the bad ideas. And that's what I mean when I say that that markets are like an ecosystem that grows solutions because we have this this army of 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 solution seeking of solution seekers we call entrepreneurs really sorting out what the next trying out what the next solution is in a context of information rich market signals and that's what the where the magic of of the market comes about is it allows us in a very bottom up process to sort the good ideas from the bad ideas. Well, when you think about young people, and this to me has been the the ironic part of the embracing of socialism by by the younger generation is that they seem to be very entrepreneurial. They don't expect to go to a job nine to five and, and work there for 40 years and get a pension. They expect to make lots of changes in their jobs. Many of them talk about wanting to start their own business. Do you think we have this ability to connect the importance of the free market to what they actually want to achieve in their life? And have we been making that connection? Have we been talking to them and showing them um, what is a solution for how they see success? in their own life? I I would say it's two things. It is wanting to see success in their own life. And on that respect, I think that most students, most uh, students are are when they're finishing uh, up a course or or they've walked out of a student meeting, they're also walking over to the career services department in their their college or university. They have ambitions that they're pursuing alongside their moral and uh, broader social commitments. So I I don't think of that as as the concern uh, necessarily, Um, but where the where the tension lies is when they look out in the world and they they may feel um, actually quite optimistic about what their own prospects are. 
students oftentimes have deep commitments and concerns with respect to how the rest of a society is faring. And they look out in the world and they, and they see a, a system that is still left too many people behind. They see, um, you know, a kind of a two-tiered sort of uh, system that favors some group, some people and, and not others, and they want to see solutions. So in that respect, I think that that's where uh, those who favor more market-based outcomes have fallen short in being able to ex- explain how it is and why it is that markets are the source of of the prosperity that they do currently enjoy and that they want for others, it's, it's been a harder sell along those lines. And I think in part because that bottom-up understanding of where progress comes from is not obvious. It's not an easy idea to really wrap your head around to um, understand that, that human progress is not designed from the top down but instead bubbles up from, from the bottom. And even going back to the clip that Bernie Sanders, um, the clip that we played of Bernie Sanders, he talks a lot about the wealthiest 1%. He talks about income inequality and the poor getting poorer is the richer getting richer. And I think that gets to the element that you were just discussing. How does income inequality factor into that? What system addresses the concerns that so many people have about income inequality? The first thing we have to, I want to pull the lens back a little bit, Beverly, because the first thing that we have to uh, recognize is that Income growth from the very first, uh, in the very first place, only comes about through market coordination. And, and that when we look at the long expanse of human history, when we see the big upward shifts of human well-being, it has always been because we have had bottom-up entrepreneurial discovery emerging. And that, that's from the starting point of even the agricultural revolution, certainly, of course, the Industrial Revolution and more recently the Digital Revolution, each of these, of these upward trajectories has only come about because people have had the relative increase in freedom to be able to engage in market activity. So if we want to understand inequality, the first question that we want to, the first question we need to ask is, what gave rise to the growth in the first place, and that's market activity. From there, then we can start to ask questions like, well, uh, if there, what has been the um, trajectory of, of, of growth going forward? What are the obstacles that remain uh, that keep some people from really realizing the benefits of a market economy? And, and one of the things we can, we can point to are all of the, the massive regulatory hurdles that people have to overcome, particularly at the bottom rungs of the economic ladder. And so I would want to start there in terms of trying to identify source points of, of the inequality that many of us are concerned about across the ideological spectrum. So when it comes to policies and even thinking through free markets and what um, yields to or what policies help bring about freer markets, what have you seen, let's say, in the past few years? Um, has there been anything under the Trump administration that you can point to that's been beneficial? And any policies that you are looking towards that would say this would help us when it comes to a robust free market system in the country? There's, it's a mixed bag with respect for the, with the current administration. One of the things that we are seeing is a real effort at dismantling the administrative state, that um, sort of com- complex of, of regulations and agencies that, that put a kind of lock grip on, uh, on the market and, and market discovery and, and entrepreneurial discovery. By dismantling much of that administrative state, that's really helpful in kind of greasing the wheels of the market. And so when I talked about in Sweden and Denmark the irony that it's in those contexts that we have a lot of economic freedom, um, that's, that's a real benefit, that that's part of the reason why they are able to generate a lot of wealth that then we can decide uh, as, a, as a society what we do with that wealth, whether, it's, um, uh, whether we have a lot of uh, redistribution or not, is a separable question. But to get the wealth in the first place, we need to make sure that the economy is not gripped in a kind of uh, regulatory gridlock. So that's one of the things that I think has been positive. 
um, with respect to uh, the current administration. But, of course, then you go to um, uh, the regime uncertainty with respect to trade that is that is that that we're currently facing with the current administration. Um, you know, that's just a, a ghastly thing for free market society to have to face all of this uncertainty with respect to what's the... Um, what's the tariff regime going to be next month or next year, uh, that's going to rein in investments in sectors that rely on free and open markets across borders. Well, going back to your Wall Street Journal piece that you wrote a few weeks back, one of the things that I love that you mentioned it is that you talk about there the importance of having conversations with people that you disagree with. And so I know part of what you do, you you talk a lot about um, the importance of free speech and having open and compelling dialogue with people. Tell us a little bit about some of the ways that we can talk with people who disagree because you've given some good pointers on that. Yeah, I appreciate that, Beverly, because this is one of the important things in this discussion about free speech, especially on on college campuses, but also in the broader society, is that I am an avid advocate of of free speech and and speech freedom, but there's only so much heavy lifting that First Amendment principles can do for us. The rest of the project for creating positive productive dialogue is really more of a cultural project. And for that, we need to internalize some of the, the best practices or principles that drive us forward on, on what makes for a good conversation. And so can you give us some specific tips and in, in even thinking, okay, if I'm going to have a conversation with someone, what is something I should avoid as far as a, a tactic in talking to them about it? And what are different things that we can implement? Two things that I always like to put together are critical thinking and sympathetic listening. Critical thinking is essential, and it's the cornerstone of what it means to be a liberally educated person. It's that respect for reason and evidence. And so, absolutely, we need critical thinking in to have a good, productive conversation. We also, though, need sympathetic listening. And so, what sympathetic listening is, is when we suspend at least momentarily, that that drive to find the slightest crack in our conversation partner's uh, argument, just to suspend that search for the, the slightest mistake just for a moment so I can really hear what my conversation partner is trying to get at. What's their broader project? What's, what is it that they're, that they're trying to help me understand? And yes, I could maybe challenge them in the next breath, but right now I just really want to listen to you to understand what your, what your, what your driving goal is in helping me to understand. What is it you want me to, uh, to know? And so if I can listen sympathetically, that can actually move us over those little stumbling blocks where either of us might misstep in, in a, in a small way. Let's be able to be willing to set those aside so we can get at the bigger picture. That allows us to take the leaps forward in mutual understanding. I may not persuade you, you may not persuade me, but at least I know why this other person who's a smart person looking at the same world that I'm looking at comes to a different conclusion. If I understand that, then that's been a productive conversation. And as somebody who works in the communications field, this is my hope that people can actually have good dialogue about these issues and instead of shutting down conversation to actually have better conversation. But sadly, we see a lot of um, incivility in, in the public today. We see a lot of free speech rights being neglected on college campuses. Do you have hope for how we can talk with each other? And do you have hope that the conversation about socialism versus capitalism and free markets will actually help us move forward in a better direction? I do have hope about the level of conversation, both within the academy and in the broader world, mainly because so many people understand that it's a problem. It doesn't mean that it's easily fixed, but I think that we are paying closer attention to uh, those those of us who care about the quality of our conversations are paying closer attention to how we're engaging in those conversations. But that's going to take a considered effort. We're going to have to be willing to hold ourselves to account to those high standards of what I would call conversational ethics. 
and also be willing to challenge one another civilly and respectfully when we see people, uh, you know, st- having having uh, sloppy uh, discursive habits, right? When we let, for example, um, you know, ideo- a drive towards ideological purity stand in for an argument, we can say, you know what, that's not an argument. We need to back up here and, and actually have an exchange of ideas rather than just shaming one another and name-calling one another. That's not a productive way forward so that we can call each other on that when we, when we are going down one of those pathways that lead us to a kind of a corrosive conversation. So, Emily, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, especially since you're always willing to talk about how we talk to each other, which is what I love to hear as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Beverly. It's been a pleasure. And, of course, thank you all for joining us. If you have more interest in the topic we discussed, you can find more of Emily's work at theihs.org. Do check out many of her articles there. Also, the Independent Women's Forum has lots on the topic of socialism. So go to the website at iwf.org. Last, if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, do leave us a rating or a review. It does help. And we'd love it if you share this episode and let your friends know where they can find more She Thinks episodes. From all of us here at Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening. 